Hi, everyone. Welcome to our experiment series uh, with Imagine Science Films. Uh, this is actually part of our Fieldwork World Cup series, uh, where we talk to many different scientists about the technology and science uh, related to the World Cup. Uh, today, we have Alan Fox, who will be discussing uh, competition and the psychology of competition specifically. Um, he was a professional athlete and still plays tennis today. He was a quarterfinalist at Wimbledon and then ended up getting his PhD at UCLA. Um, Alan, would you like to tell us a little bit about you know, how you went from athletics to specifically the psychology of athletes? Well, of course, in, in my day, and this was the 1960s, um, athletics and college went together. I was on a, a tennis scholarship at UCLA. So my, my, my tennis was, was getting me my education. And so I played the tour. When I, I went on to grad school and played the tour every summer uh, during my years of grad school in the 60s. So the two, the two were complementary in a sense. Um, I, I did not intend to be a sports psychologist when, uh, when I was at UCLA or when I was playing tennis. That happened later and, and more by chance than anything else. Uh, actually after, after I graduated uh, from UCLA and got my degree and after I finished playing the tour, I actually went to work in the investment business because I realized at the time that it was very handy to have money. So much of it in grad <laughs> and, and in tennis, tennis was an amateur game at the time. Okay, we were paid appearance money, under the table money, so to speak. Uh, the tournaments were the same as now, except there wasn't prize money. There was uh, sort of negotiated fees for playing, which is what we got. So, how did you originally get involved in tennis? Um, in the sports psych aspect. Um, in terms of your personal draw to tennis, was it about, you think, the psychology of the competition? Or was there another aspect that really attracted you to the game? Well, te you know, what attracted me to tennis was winning tennis matches. Now, uh, you can't separate psychology from that particularly. I mean, you, you, when you compete, uh, and particularly at high levels, but at any level, I mean, you soon find out that there's a mental aspect to the whole thing. Right. In other words, people get nervous. They want to win. It's it's natural. Uh, they choke. They get uh, discouraged when they get behind. Uh, any professional athlete runs into all the same kind of problems. You know, right. the choking, the discouragement, the anger. You get mad when you when things aren't going your way. When you miss easy shots. All of these things are part of the process. I didn't think of it particularly as sports psychology at the time. Uh, these were problems that needed to be solved uh, in order to win. The, 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 sports, the whole sports psychology field was somewhat non-existent at that time. I mean, you, there, there weren't courses in sports psychology that I took. Uh, I was actually asked to write articles for Tennis Magazine on the mental side of the game because I had a doctorate in psychology. Uh, and so that's, that's how I started uh, as a, quote, sports psychologist. Yeah. Was, so was I guess further into your, into your career as a psychologist, uh, you know, did you find that personally the pressure of being surrounded by fans was kind of where that, that sense of competition was coming from, or do you think it was more of an internalized uh, kind of feeling to win? Uh, the, the feeling to win, the drive to win, for me, was internalized. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't worried about other people. Uh, I wasn't pushed by my parents. It was none of that. It was uh, the, the game seemed to me a game that I wanted to win. I think the wiring is such and all of us are somewhat wired uh, when we compete to want to win I mean there's no way around it I think that's the nature of the beast and so uh, I mean yes some people are pushed and maybe they get even more motivated I don't know I was personally self-motivated yeah not pushed at all and and I just hated losing and and losing was torture and so 
right, right. I, I wanted to do what I could to avoid that. Uh, so I guess if you want to walk us through a little bit of you know what happens uh, psychologically when you're kind of at that crunch moment in the game. Uh, you know, is there kind of a uh, a typical process that your kind of mind goes through when you're in that moment of, you know, I'm almost, I'm almost going to win, you know, and there's so much pressure. Is there something that universally happens in, in all players? Well, I can, I can tell you the sequence probably for most players. I can't speak for everybody. Uh, I've done a lot of consulting with pro players, and so it, it does turn out that most of them think somewhat they have the same issues I had. Okay. Mm -hmm. The way it starts is you got a match coming up. Okay, you got a tournament match to play, so you're nervous. You're nervous. You're nervous pretty much on edge, much of the day before. You don't. You can't completely relax. Why? Because there's an uncertainty. If you play somebody that's good, there's it's an uncertain outcome. You don't know if you're going to win or lose, mm -hmm. uh, and you do know that you want to win a lot. And you certainly don't want to lose a lot. And right, so right. there's a big discrepancy in the outcome, but you don't know which you're going to get. And so that puts you somewhat on edge before the match. Um, I used to coach Pepperdine University, as an example, uh, the men's tennis team. And before big matches, the day before or before we we're going to go to a tournament, I would notice my players would be more likely to get angry. There'd be more rackets thrown into the fence. Uh, there'd be more cursing than usual. And why? Because the pressure is starting to ramp up about whether you're going to win or not. Right, if, right. I, if I could give everybody a guarantee, you know, uh, from, from on high, that they're going to win their match, all that pressure would go away. Okay? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the uncertainty of it. So you start out edgy and uncertain. Okay. Then you recognize in a sport like tennis, but basically well, the, the individual sports are actually more difficult, okay, because uh, the pressure is on you all the time. There's no uh, help for you. If you can't perform, then you lose. And so there's this constant, a tennis match may last three hours, and there's a constant pressure to focus on every point. Otherwise, you tumble and lose. Right, a right. team sport, there's pressure on a team sport also, all the time. It's not quite as intense. It gets quite intense in a team sport when you get right near the end or you have to make a free throw or, or kick the final goal, whatever. It, it, it can get pretty intense and everyone can choke, you know, mm -hmm. under these types of pressures. But during during the course of it, the, the objective is to keep the emotions under control. They're difficult to control in competition. Yeah. The more important the competition, the more difficult to control the emotions. Okay. Yeah. By, by control, I mean, a, as you compete, you make mistakes. You can't help it. You make some great plays, some good ones, and you make some mistakes. And you're, you're happy with the good ones, but the mistakes, if you react to these things, your emotions start to run. You know, you get upset. When right. you get upset... You, you, you interfere with the habit patterns that you develop, and then you make more mistakes. So if you're, if you're really a good competitor, you find out that, that your game and your performance tends to follow your emotions. Okay? And so once you're competing, the best you can do is to control the emotions. You, know, you, you have to accept very quickly what you can't control, and you try to control what you can I mean, the habits that you have in, in your sport are honed down by years of repetitive practice. Okay, the more repetitions, the stronger the habit. Okay, and, and when you're competing, all you know, you're you're basically relying on a set of habits that you've worked up to a certain point. At the pro right, level, right. you've gotten pretty good at them. All right, but but they're fallible. Yeah. Um, once you're competing, the habits don't get any better. You know, they get better through hours and hours of practice. That's all over now. Now you're competing, and now it's emotion. The emotions, if you get angry, you can throw a monkey wrench into the habits. If you get discouraged, if your emotional energy goes down, 
the habits don't function well. You get slow. You make mistakes. You know, if you get very nervous, if you think, and 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 by the way, the the real pressures in in, in most of the the competitions come towards the end. They come when you have a chance to win. Right. Okay? right. As you get so close, well, in the circumstance that yeah, you were pretty confident that you were going to win a certain game, how would your psychology be different? I mean, does that address the pressure psychologically? There's two situations, basically, I found in my own personal, and, and I find it when I, when I consult. Either the person is confident they're going to win, they think they're going to win, somehow, for some reason, or they don't. Okay. Now, when you, when you think you're going to win, like if I played somebody that, that I thought I was much better than, in my mind, I wasn't going to lose this person because because I'm better than they are. At that point, there isn't much pressure. Okay, there isn't much. And as you get near the end, there isn't much. You know, because I think I'm going to win. You know, so it, it, it it's nothing but fun. In fact, the most fun that I ever had playing competitive tennis matches was when I played somebody that was good, but I figured I would beat them for sure, and in front of a big crowd. That that was the maximum fun you could have. It, it it was not fun for me when I played somebody that was as good or better than I was, and that I was uncertain and not confident that I would win. I knew I might win, I could win, but I I, I wouldn't say I'm gonna win. You know, I wouldn't bet my neck on it. In those situations, then there's a lot of pressure, and then there's a lot of stress, and the stress grows as you get closer to the finish. And, and yeah. paradoxically, paradoxically, you get more nervous when you're ahead than when you're behind. When right. you're down and about to right. lose, you're usually not nervous, particularly. I wasn't. And most people that I've consulted with aren't. They get nervous when they're ahead and just about to win. Which, really? Really? Yeah. And, 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 and the average person would think that's odd because, I mean, you hear this, they're afraid of winning. Okay, you may have heard that expression, uh, some sort of pop psychologist throw that out, because that's what it looks like. I mean, you get right on the verge of winning, and all you have to do is make a couple of shots and it's over, and you play badly. Well, it's not because you're afraid of winning. It looks like it, but it isn't. What, what, what the players are afraid of is they've got them. They've got their chance, and now all they have to do is finish it up. Yeah, okay. yeah. And there's the uncertainty as to whether you're going to be able to. And all of us know that until, until the match or the game is totally over, you can still lose. Tennis in particular is like that because you can, there is no time clock. I mean, you actually have to win match point. If you don't win match point, you will never win the match. So you get out there and you go, I, I, I have to win this particular point. If I don't win it, we're back to deuce. i got to get to it again. And then ultimately, this match will, I will not win this match until I win that point. That, that's pressure. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's better, it's slightly less pressure if you have a clock, although there's pressure also. But if you have a clock, it, as long as you perform, you don't have to do anything spectacular. You just have to stay in there if you're ahead and, the, and, and, and you, you can play neutral, you can run out the clock. Right, well, right. So, that, so that, what that, would be your thoughts on uh, the psychology of competition versus say soccer or another sport that involves a clock? Yeah, soccer is a clock deal. Right, there's right. A, there's a time limit. I mean, if you get ahead enough goals, if you get ahead far enough, then you can play defensive. You can change your your strategy and and basically, you know, not take as many risks, and you can run out the clock. Okay, it's dangerous to do that. By the right, way, I've right. seen a, a lot of when when you start to get conservative, uh, when you get a conservative mentality, you don't perform well. And and I and I've seen many uh, a team situation where there's a clock where where a team is trying to just be conservative and run off the clock. They get they play so badly they stand around and they get paralyzed, and so the other team is able to run up the score pretty quickly. So. Uh, 
it's a tricky one. It's best to play somewhat aggressively. You know, you, you can cut down the, the the big risk, but but you, you can't get like so tight and conservative that you're just totally waiting for the other team to screw up. Right. A bad. And strategy. so when you say, I mean, at, at this level of competition, it sounds like a, a physical ability at this point is mostly m muscle memory, um, and that psychology really is the most important aspect. Well, you have two things going, okay? You have your physical talent, your muscle memory, your you know speed of reaction time, your eyesight, all, all the physical things. You have those going and, and, and superimposed on that is, is your mentality, okay? And you're trying to make all those physical things function. I mean, there are many great players that are not great physical athletes good physical athletes. You can't be like all thumbs, you know, but but the mental side is their strong point. You know, they can focus better, control the nerves better and so forth. There are other great athletes that are great athletes physically. They they're faster runners, their coordination is better. Mentally they may be a little weaker, but they're so good physically they win. And so there's a balance between the two. I mean, I, I would say this that there are more good athletes physically than there are good mental competitors. Okay, right. you, you can look you can look at at, at a, a, a hundred kids in your in your class in school, and you'll find a couple of them that are superior athletes. They're as good an athlete as as you would see on the professional tour in some sport, but mentally, it, the, the, it's it's much rarer. To find somebody that can compete at the highest levels. Yeah. So I guess. I, I really, go on. Oh, uh, what would be your definition of you know a a very uh, mentally fit athlete? Like, what are some characteristics of, of okay. being really mentally prepared for for this level of competition? Well, here's where it starts with the mental, and this may not seem as mental as what most people think of as mental, but mm -hmm. the ability to practice would be number one okay this is a mental trait in other words there are very in, in order to get really good at a sport take tennis or any of them I mean you gotta practice four five six hours a day hard alright you gotta be working on your skills and you gotta do that for 10 or 15 years running okay and some days it's plenty hot and it's tiring and and you don't feel like doing it and you have to do it okay mm -hmm. How many players out of a thousand are willing to go out there and sweat and do things that are hard for five or six hours a day for years at a time? Not many. Okay, so that's a rare trait. You, you go look at a hundred people, none of them will do that. Okay, so that's where it starts. It starts with the capacity for work. That's a very rare trait. Okay, that's that, that'll be number one. Without that, you're not going to develop the, the, uh, uh, habit patterns. The, mu the muscle memory won't develop. You haven't had enough repetitions. Okay, that'll that'll be point one. Uh, point two, and, and this is again in the development of the game, is where you see a lot of the mental uh, aspects that people are not thinking of it that way. They think it's the person that makes the great play on the big on the big situation. That's part of it. A small part of it. The the big part of it is getting to the big situation, and and there. There's an intelligence that you have to have when you're practicing. Like a lot of people, the average person doesn't like to work mentally. So when they're practicing, just let me use tennis as an example or soccer, they, they, their, their mind may be elsewhere as they practice. Okay, they're just going through the motions. But the, the, the greater player is thinking, what can I do better? What was wrong with that last kick? Okay, did I watch the ball close enough? Was I relaxed enough? Did I use my leg in the right way? I'm talking soccer now. Wh whatever the the physical a a aspects are, you have to be thinking of them very hard as you practice for those six hours. Each each action you do has to have some thought behind it. Now mm -hmm. it doesn't have to. I mean, a lot of the average person they don't have any thought behind it. They just do it and they gradually get better at it. But they don't pick out why they did badly this time and why they did well that time and, and, and notice the difference. 
So the, the great ones are very perceptive as to what's working and what isn't, okay? And they're trying to focus on their weaknesses, and they know how to work on their weakness, too. They're, they're good at figuring exactly how to do it. Other people have weaknesses, that they, they don't change it. Right. Good ones, they have a weakness, they see it, and they go, they, they'll drill in some way to change it and strengthen it. This so is all in the learning stage. You don't see this on the field. You see the right. result of it. Uh, but the, uh, these are rare mentalities, people that can do that. It takes, a, I mean, it takes a lot of discipline. And do you think that these characteristics are something, you know, when a coach is recruiting for a team, say, that they're looking for rather than physical ability? Do you think there's been a kind of a switch in this emphasis on, on mentality for athletes? Well, I can tell you what coaches look for in, in tennis. Okay. And, 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 and that is, you can see the physical, you can't see the mental. Okay, you can't look into the person's head. And I don't know of any really uh, accurate tests that you can give them to find out, you know, what's under the hood. Uh, but what you can tell uh, in tennis, you can tell by their ranking. If they win a lot, they're pretty good. You, 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 know, you, you tell by performance. Okay, uh, and, and now you do all else being equal. Uh, I'm going to take the better performer. I mean, they've got years of uh, performance history behind them, and so I can look up that history. I mean, if if the guy or the girl is ranked number one in the United States uh, in the juniors, I think that person I like to have them on my team. You know, I know they're pretty good mentally. They can't be bad to have reached that level. Okay. But there are other aspects. As a coach, I'm, I do want to find out about their work ethic. And, and so I, I, I used to take people on my team that were not that good uh, as far as results were concerned. If, if I heard from their coaches, from their uh, associates that say they hadn't been playing that long or that they were very hard workers or you know something that I thought that I could add uh, but but I needed the work ethic in there. The 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 the, the word hard worker to me meant uh, uh, this is the kind of person I'm interested in. You know, uh, I have I've had players that had very weak physical ability but good work ethic, and they they get to a, a relatively high level. Right. They don't get to be great champions. You, 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 if, unless they have the physical ability as well, they don't get, they don't generally win major tournaments. But they can get into the top ten in the world wow. as, a, as a pretty darn good athlete. They won't be number one. So, do you think uh, at lower levels, when uh, say high schoolers are kind of just getting into sports or younger than that? Do you think that they would benefit from having some kind of uh, like psychological assessment to kind of see uh, if they're mentally fit and have that discipline to become, you know, a star athlete? Well, I think I think they could. It, it is useful to to give them a dose of sports psychology, but of course that's what that's what good coaches do. All the great coaches are sports psychologists. That's what they are. Okay. They don't have a degree in it, but the great coaches know, number one, that they want a good day's practice out of their players, okay? They want motivated and working, and so a good coach knows how to do that. They'll convince them, they'll threaten them, they'll force them, they'll cajole them, they'll slap them on the back, something, okay? They know how to do it. They know how to do it, and so... That's why particular coaches will get, uh, you know, good performance year in and year out. They know how to work the player. And and if I was going to give you a definition, and people have asked me, they say, what's the most important uh, quality a great coach can have? Okay, is it knowledge of the game? Is it this? Is it that? What it is, the number one thing that a coach needs is the ability to control the player. That's that's number one. I mean, the coach can be as smart as you want. If, if he can't control the player, then what good does it do? He's got to be able to make the player do what he wants. 
all right? And that is a, a talent that a coach will have, and, and, and it'll be different for each coach. I mean, some, coach, some coaches just use, they scare them. <laughs> they use brute force, and, and, and you don't do what I say, and something bad's going to happen to you, okay? Yeah. The guy's going to do what he says. And then another coach says, I understand you're having a bad day, you know, you, this and that, and get some feeling good, and the next thing they'll go out and play well. All right. Yeah. Coaches do it differently. Uh, but all of them have to, in some way or another, control the player. Okay. Yeah, and they have to be aware of that psychology is just a huge part of the game, that they need to be sensitive to that aspect of it. Yeah, well, the coaches know it. The coaches, and, and that was somewhat of a shock to my system. When I first started coaching, I coached the Pepperdine men's team for eight years. Mm -hmm. And we had players, we were top five in the United States for 10 years running. We were seated, we, we got to the finals of the NCAAs a couple of times. I, I had many good players on my team and many not so good. Uh, but the shock to me when I first started coaching was how much of it was getting control of the player. You know, personally, I didn't need a lot of control as a player myself. I mean, I was a very motivated person. If the coach wasn't looking, it didn't matter to me. I was playing 100% trying to figure out how to get better because I didn't like losing. And, yeah. and I understood immediately that the harder I worked and the more repetitions, the better I was going to get and the less likely to lose. And so I didn't have to be watched by a coach. I found out that that's not common. When I first started coaching Pepperdine, I realized that there was that there was more psychology work than there was just teaching them tennis. I thought when I before I did it, I thought you, know, you go out, you show them how you, you hit the backhand better, the forehand better, some tricks on volley work, you know this and that, and they'll get better like I did. Yeah. But it didn't work like that. It was, so is there a certain technique that coaches use if uh, you know a few other players lost their last match, they're really discouraged? They want to drop out. You know how would it, how would it handle a situation like that? How do you handle discouragement, which is a constant part of the game? I mean, there it's going to be probably the talent of the coach. But you know, uh, when you've reached a certain level, like for instance, my teams at Pepperdine, the, these guys that I had on the teams were all ranked maybe top 30 in the United States. I might take somebody lower ranked than that occasionally, but they'd be ranked in the top 100 in the United States. And now a person that's that high ranking has already got 10 years in the game. Okay, they've got a lot invested. So their, their talk about quitting tennis, they may say that, they're not going to quit. <laughs> they, they can't, they're in it too deeply. They've got scholarships. They've got a lot of reason. So I, I don't take it seriously that they're going to quit. That's a that's sort of a short term. Uh, it's a short term pro. That's a short term issue. Uh, I mean, basically, they come off the court, they lose. You stay away from them for a while. I mean, depending on the player. Okay. <laughs> Usually, they're not terribly receptive. Yeah, I quit. I hate this game. I'm never playing again. If I can't play better than that, it's not worth playing. You hear a lot of that sort of stuff. I don't take it terribly seriously. I know they're down. That's I, I know also that I may know what they did wrong. That's not the time to start telling them, you know, you needed to hit the forehand cross court more. The guy's bat forehand was weak. You need whatever. You know, I wait. You know. Yeah. That cools yeah. off. That cools off. If they miss if they misbehave in certain ways, I do have to come down on them as a coach. You can use force. Okay. You can use force on them. Uh, in certain situations, <laughs> after it's over, the, you know, uh, uh, the discouragement aspect that passes, and then you, you talk. If, if a person is losing because they're angry, they've lost control of their emotions, okay, and they're an angry player. That kind of player you use force on, okay, you, because you can stop the anger. I mean, a person can control the anger if they want to. Okay, anger is the easiest thing to control, by the way. Yeah. All right. Very, very common uh, yeah. and, and easy to control. And, and, and it's controlled basically 
by the player's decision that they're not going to get angry. It would be interesting to, to interview some of the, the players of the World Cup, you know, after their teams have been eliminated, just because, I mean, obviously soccer is their passion. They've dedicated their lives to this. You know, I think initial reactions are anger or discouragement, but, you know, obviously they're going to continue playing the game. It's, it's something that has become a part of their culture and their life. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right after a loss, you know, most people, they don't take and uh, it doesn't really matter. After the loss, I mean, it's over. So you can take it any way you want. You can bang your head on the wall if you wish or not. You know, uh, it is helpful if you're in a, in a sport where there's another match coming before too long. It's helpful to get over it quicker rather than slower. Okay. But the initial pain is probably good for them. Okay. <laughs> because... You know, when things are getting tough and you, you, you feel like it's not worth it, you feel like quitting or something, it's useful to know that you're going to suffer afterwards. It's going to be very painful. If you give in to that feeling that it's not my day or whatever, you know, if, if you don't do everything you can, you're going to feel pretty bad afterwards. That, that's a motivating factor that will keep you out there. It kept me out there. I mean, yeah. there were times when it was hot, and I was tired, and I'd been playing for two or three hours, and, and I'm thinking, God, I'd just like to have a Coke. You know, I, I got another tournament coming up next week. You know, it's, you start playing games with yourself, you know. But if you know, no, don't buy it. I know at the end of this, after I've had the Coke, I'm going to be very sorry that I didn't try harder, you know. Yeah. And so... The, the, maybe the pain of the loss has some positive value to it. Not too much. I mean, not to <laughs> self immolate. But enough to uh, motivate them. <laughs> it, it, it's motivating. It's motivating. And, and these games at the highest levels, they take great mental effort. It takes an effort, be it soccer or basketball or any of them. You, you, you've got to be all there mentally and you've got to be sort of emotionally under control so you feel good, all right? And all of this is forced or pushed out of, out of position by discouragement, by uh, things going wrong, or maybe even things going too good. It's too easy. You know, you start to relax because it, it, it's tempting to relax when things are going really easy for you. Yeah. yeah. All of these things, you know, end up throwing you off and making you a less uh, successful competitor. So the successful ones have all these things in mind and they're going to keep control of the whole thing until the game's over, until they right, win right. or lose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, as, a, as a final comment, I, I would say this to, to maybe young athletes, and that is athletics are very, very good for people in general. Uh, outside of the sport itself, okay? The, the, the athlete will learn more on the playing field than they will in a classroom. I used to think, you know, I, I, where, where you... Sorry about that. I used to think, uh, you know, that, that school was more important than the sport. Sport, you play after school, and, and it was your studies that were more important. And, you know, tennis was a game I played for fun. I liked it and worked on it and so forth. Uh, really, the life lessons, and I don't mean to knock school because you need your education. You've got to get your days. But, you know, do I use the calculus? Not very much. You know, how, how much algebra do I use? Not very much. Uh, but I use a lot of the things I learned on the tennis court, like if I work hard enough and I don't give up, I'm liable to succeed, okay? And that you've got to control yourself. You've got to control your emotions and into a situation where you get emotional and your logic system doesn't work well. Those are lessons that you don't learn so much in the classroom. You learn them on the playing field. So for that reason, I, would, I have a lot of respect for athletes that go after their sport hard. And I think they learn things that they're probably not going to be professional athletes, most people. 
but whatever else they do, they're going to be better at it than, say, someone who hasn't experienced years of work trying to get good at something, trying to win. So for that, there's value in sport, win or lose. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. All right.